its philosophy and methods. Its enemies shall wither and die. Its allies shall wither and die. The universe and all within it shall wither and die. And when the great corruption has settled over the land and permeated the very foundations of reality itself, then shall the Lord of all rise from the rot and ruin, spread its arms wide to reclaim all its dutiful children. From The Victory of Rebirth A Litany of Inevitability Though they strive to embrace each day of life left to them, to forestall the inevitable, those who serve Nurgle must accept their eventual death. They must also believe in the equal certainty of rebirth. This hope for something new and glorious is the great comfort that the Plague Father has shared with them. It is a hope born from Nurgle's own understanding of the workings of the universe. Just as its followers have accepted the teachings of their lord, Nurgle itself long ago accepted that decay brings an end to all things, but that through such decay, life begins anew. Decay is the victor in all battles, the opposition to which there is no resistance. This is why Nurgle embraces decay as a weapon, as a tool, as a means of instructing and guiding his followers. Decay is at the core of its philosophy and methods, blessed with reshaped forms and renewed purpose. The minions of Nurgle become its instruments in its ultimate purpose the great corruption and ultimate reshaping of the universe. As vessels and embodiments of decay, mortals and demons alike are effectively living fuel, powering the great cycle through their actions and indeed their simple rotting, infectious presence in the realm of chaos and on the mortal plane. Decay is glorious. Few who pledge themselves to Nurgle do so in the belief that it offers an easy path to power and glory. It does not promise increased influence, brutal strength, or hedonistic excess like its fellow gods. Those who turn to it for aid are not seeking to make their dreams become reality, to strike down those who stand in opposition, or to be adored by all who know them. No, most mortals who find their way into Nurgle's footed embrace wish only for an end to some sort of suffering. They call to it to protect them from the ravages of disease, to save them from the slow, painful death of unchecked infection, or to otherwise spare them from whatever may ail them. There are even some who do not seek it out, but are instead visited by one of its messengers and offered a bargain. No matter if they sought its gifts or if they themselves were found, the exchange is never quite what was expected. These mortals have their doubts and fears cast aside. They find that they are no longer caught in the paralyzing grip of despair and misery. Their afflictions, however, linger and are usually joined by other blight. New sores and pustules appear, the foul liquids they contain becoming home to small worms and maggots. Bellies swell and distend, the flesh straining to contain bleeding entrails that push the abdomen outward. Old wounds rip open again spontaneously and invite fresh infections. 
Whatever diseases or weakness these mortals once sought to leave behind, take up permanent residence within their bodies and minds. All this must be accepted as the first lesson Nurgle teaches. Decay is inescapable, but also glorious. This knowledge is illuminating for those who follow Nurgle. If all things decay, each moment is a gift. Why not use these moments to shape what is to come and secure a place in it? Why sit idly by, wallowing in pain and sorrow, when there is so much to do and so little time in which to do it? As these thoughts race through the minds of the newly converted, it dawns on them. Their pain is deadened. Even with so many new afflictions, so much rancid corruption of the flesh, the suffering has abated. Hope arrives. For these newest of Nurgle's adopted children, it is as if the morning fog has lifted and they see the world clearly with fresh eyes. Why had they complained about their poxes and failing bodies? What selfish desire to change their fates had prevented them from realizing their true purpose. Rot, glorious rot, becomes the constant companion for a servant of the Lord of All, instructing them, guiding their path, and reminding them that they are fortunate beyond measure to have been chosen by Nurgle to receive its gifts. Indeed, many discover that the initial malady from which they suffered, the one that drove them to seek salvation in the first place, was actually originally bestowed upon them by Nurgle. Rather than anger, it is joy that springs from this knowledge. These mortals believe themselves to have been chosen destined for greatness as a true champion of Nurgle. The Champions of Decay Relatively few of those who receive Nurgle's glorious blessings distinguish themselves as much more than a tiny but welcome maggot. Doing their part to eat away at the rotting corpse that is the decaying universe. Those who do differentiate themselves invariably exemplify the precepts of Nurgle's philosophy and emulate its grand and corrupted form at a level that leaves no doubt as to which of the Runa's powers has claimed their souls. These are the Plague Father's mortal champions, and it is through their foul deeds that many of the greatest accomplishments of Nurgle's plan for the Great Corruption are achieved. So often these champions take on an appearance not unlike that of their dark patron. This is not unusual for minions of the Plague Father. Great unclean ones are said to be small, though still massive in their own right, versions of Nurgle itself, and in turn, their excreted offspring, the Nurglings, look like miniature replicas of the great unclean ones that gave them life. Likewise, mortal champions of the Plague Lord become bloated, stinking, leaking collections of rotted flesh, exposed entrails, necrotic sores, and all manner of foulness. They are surrounded by clouds of flies and followed by nurglings that splash about in the slime trails that spread out behind them to mark their passing. Unlike the minions of the other gods of chaos, Champions of Nurgle do not hesitate to pursue enemies into the most dank, disgusting, and polluted places. 
There is no cesspool or sewer noxious enough to deter Nurgle's followers. No quarantine plague zone is off limits. Once a champion of Nurgle has a scent of its foe, no amount of stink can throw it off. The determination that is such part and parcel of all that Nurgle's lessons impart serves its champions well, as they do whatever must be done to serve their lord. Lesser worshippers of Nurgle who follow them are unperturbed by the grotesque condition of its chaos champions and draw inspiration from the macabre beauty of their rotting forms, the sickly sweet odor of their rancid flesh and the corruptive acts they commit in the name of Grandfather Nurgle. The Plague Lord's followers all end up mimicking its appearance in one way or another. Some even become its children, because they started out in life bearing some passing resemblance to it. Nurgle is more than form though, it is also philosophy. Most mortal Nurgleite Chaos champions and many lesser followers end up thinking like it does, though in a limited fashion due to the constraints of mortal minds, but it is the demonic champions that know their father's thoughts the best. Great unclean ones understand Nurgle in a way that no mortal, not even one elevated to the rank of demon prince, ever could. They are nearer to their god than any mortal, and more closely involved in its plans than any plague bearer or other demonic servant. There is little place for jealousy or scheming in the Garden of Nurgle, or any of its domains beyond, and its demon princes know this. Though they wish for nothing more than to be one with the Plague Father, they also know they will never be as close to it as the Great Unclean Ones are. As they do with so much else as a result of Nurgle's teachings, they accept their lot. This relationship to their god differs from that of other demon princes. The other runer's powers take particular pleasure in deceiving mortals, damning them into their service by tricking them with lies and promises they know they will almost certainly never need to keep. They see their demonic followers, even their most powerful greater demons, as never having had a choice but to do as they are commanded. They view these demons more as slaves to darkness than co-conspirators with it. In their eyes, this makes mortal servants somehow more interesting. Nurgle on the other hand knows most of its mortal followers turn to him as a last act of desperation, but its demonic minions, most especially the great unclean ones, have genuine affection for Grandfather Nurgle and serve him out of love. Nurgle, for its part, delights in reciprocating, reminding it as it does of a kind of cycle and therefore the Plague Lord takes great interest and pride in the efforts of its demonic servants. The desires of Nurgle and its champions are one. Each knows that the great corruption is a higher purpose that must be served, and they do so with great resolve and satisfaction. A Great Game the major chaos gods are all ultimately after the same thing. Each wishes to overthrow the existing order of the universe and claim dominion over both the realm of chaos and the mortal world. The questions of how this is to be achieved and which lord the universe will call master are answered very differently by each of the dark gods. 
Starnash would see all of existence turned into a playground in which it and its minions could eternally explore new delights. Corn desires nothing more than to claim every skull and drop of blood to use as the mortar with which to build the foundations of his new kingdom. Zinj surely has its own plans for what a twisted reality reshaped in its image would look like, but it has not shared what that might be. Perhaps it does not even know itself. To Nurgle, these alternatives are indistinguishable, self-indulgent fantasies with no sense of greater purpose or understanding of the nature of things. To it, the ambitions of the others seem small. Reality will be remade. Both the mortal plane and the realm of chaos have ever been on a path of decay, and from decay come death and the end. The end, but not finality. It seems that Nurgle alone comprehends the meaning of this, the distinction. Where its brother gods each envision a destination at the end of the path, Nurgle knows that the journey turns ever back upon itself in a loop, leading to rebirth, revitalization, and new beginnings. It is this fundamental divergence of views that sets Nurgle at odds with the other Runa's powers, for it means that they are not actually working toward the same thing that it is. On the surface, it appears to the others that while the methods each employs may be different, the end result is much the same. The destruction of the Imperium of Man, the enslavement or destruction of all mortals, and final dominion over all existence. This is, though, a superficial understanding. Differences come to light in many ways. Sanesh is content to allow plague marines to inflict grievous damage on an army through blight and disease, but is then perplexed when Nurgle's servants do not allow the minions of the Prince of Pleasure to play with the wounded, absconding with their shattered forms before the lights can be explored. To Korn, it is all well and good to work with its brother Nurgle in an effort to blast a crude colony into oblivion, but it cannot fathom why the Plague Lord insists on leaving their former homeland untouched rather than raise it to a charred, lifeless stone. Still, these incidents pass written off as the eccentricities of their jolly brother. Zinj, however, is another matter entirely. It refuses to give Nurgle its due or to allow it to pursue its own path. It tweaks, twists and diverts. It warps, redirects and alters. The Lord of Change is unable to accept that which will surely come to pass. It is constantly looking to modify the rules to its advantage so that its desired ending is the one that will come to pass, even if that means interfering with Nurgle's desires, no matter how small the consequences of those desires may appear to be. Nurgle knows that such meddling is pointless. It knows that the journey down the path does not stop, but the machinations of its brother are vexing and irritating just the same. The actions of Korn and Slanesh are a small inconvenience, but Zinch's games play havoc with Nurgle's plans, creating setbacks that are needless and counterproductive to not only Nurgle's own goals, but also those of the other Dark Gods. 
Very little causes Nurgle's smile to dip, but Zinj seems to be able to provoke that reaction at will. When this universe dies and then rises again, it is one of the greatest hopes of the Lord of All that, like the Emperor of Mankind, Zeej will not be reborn with it.